Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so I'm a little bit more nervous than Carl, I guess, and one of the reasons is that I'm an introvert person while well, he seemed like a very extrovert person to me. But my mom always used to comfort me with saying, well, but you know, people hate talking in front of people. There's always on top of the list if you ask them. And, and number two is always death. And uh, so I'm struggling a little bit here what I'm going to think of today. But I was thinking there was a great icebreaker exercise in, in the talk before here. This time we're going to talk about metrics. Wonderful, right? Um, so what kind of person am I and who am I and why am I here? To give you a little bit of a of background of, of who I am, I work for a company called Handsoft. There's a Handsoft coach. And uh, pretty much I could say that I'm have done some coding, so I've been a developer. I work for a tool vendor, right? We make an agile and lean project management tool, and it's hard to not be a little bit of a structure fascist when you're doing something like that. Um, and I'm working my way up to become this creative genius with you know deep experience from the trenches and so forth. So I hope I can give a little bit of a different perspective from any of the other speakers here today and kind of talk about metrics um, from that perspective. So instead of talking about uh, this slide first. What I can bring, though, which I think is fairly interesting, is and what I do from a, as a hands of coach is that I travel the world. So I meet a lot of teams, and I do very short gigs for them. So I work eight hours in Boston, then I do four hours in Montreal, and then I go back to Sweden and meet someone, or go to Japan and Korea and so forth. So I've discovered a few patterns over the years I have done this. So that's what I'm going to talk about today from a metrics perspective and a flow perspective. And why do we need to understand flow with metrics? Why, why does metrics relate to what we're talking about here today? And I want to bring up this first metric. This whole presentation has a lot, a lot of metrics in it. It was Deming who said that 94% of all the problems are called by systems instead of the people. And it's, I've seen it quoted in so many places, and it's always often brought up in meetings and so forth. And it's completely fake, you know. Of course it's not 94%. There's no way that he can, he can know this number. So it's his kind of estimate, and it's become a truth. But if it is really this important, even though it's maybe 50%, or even it's not even possible to set a percentage on it, it kind of says that metrics can give us a lot of information. It's a great way to communicate, and also can also help us add a lot of understanding to, to the flows. But the kind of flows I'm talking about it's not really that much about the, the sort of flow that Carl was talking about previously. You know, how do we get into that perfect phase of delivering as individuals or even as a flow as a group? I'm a little bit more of a tool focus guy, right? So we're going to talk about A, then we do B, then we're going to reach a desired state. These kind of flows. So I think they tie together fairly much as a little bit different talks. And you can't make a presentation like this without building up, bringing up the Lean Startup model. It's a great model. I, everybody, you know, I think it works perfect for many teams to try to get into thinking about how do we understand our flow and so forth. And it's fairly interesting because it's an, you know, it explains an inductivist way of thinking. And I realized that was first explained in a book the same year this place was built, in the 1620s or so. I read it somewhere here. So it's a very, very old way of, of thinking. You know, we, we need to go out and observe, and we go and come up with something better and so forth. But, but you know, I just want to bring up first, what has science learned since the 1620s in how knowledge kind of moves? And uh, very much now it's about paradigms, that knowledge transfers in paradigms. It's not only, you know, this is the taxi industry, then we have Uber revolutionizing their whole new paradigm of how we do things. It's also the same is true in knowledge. So for example, if we look at a field such as physics, Lord Kelvin says in the year 1900 that there's nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. And then a few years later, there was a guy called Einstein who thought a little bit, hmm. And then he came up with relativity theory revolutionized everything in physics. Turns out that everything we thought we knew was completely wrong. And you can see this pattern over and over again. So my claim here today is basically that the way we are, 
or have been looking at metrics and working with data and so forth is really in a shift. And for some of you, I see this with the teams. Many of the things I will say now is completely obvious, of course. And for others, it's like, no, wait, this is you know, not the way we do things and so forth. So I want to start with giving you three examples. What, what kind of separates the existing paradigm and what do I see that very successful teams are doing in what I claim is, is a completely new paradigm. The first thing is that working software is the primary measure of progress. You know, it's stated in the Agile Manifesto, everybody's, you know, we need to look at our burn down chart. We need to understand how many points are we delivering each sprint and we can throw out the rest. That's, that's it. Um, on a thought leader basis, I think Douglas Hubbard and how to measure anything is, is a great guy in this sense that he's talking about how we can actually measure anything we want. You know, why do we measure working software only? We can do so much more today. And he also says that science was never about having data. Science is all about getting data. So, you know, we, we can go and look at anything we want. Why are we just looking at working software? It's fairly boring. Um, I also want to bring up an example from one of our customers or was in a workshop with, with the CEO of uh, one of our bigger customers. And he said, like, you know, you know, you go, you're, you're a, a little bit of a consultant, and you go out and say, so what do you want to look at? And he says, you know, I don't know what I want to look at. I, the only thing I know is that everything we have been looking at in the past didn't help us. It's a whole new world out there. We're facing completely new competition. We need to look at something different, but I have no idea what I want to look at. You know, tell me what I should look at. And, you know, they moved away from, from using burnouts and so forth because it didn't really help them reaching their goal. So I would say that the next paradigm is very much about to not stay dogmatic about which metrics that are being used. Um, you know, if, if a burndown is helping you, look at a burndown. If it doesn't help you, throw it out and realize what is it actually that is, that is helping you. The next thing I want to talk about is another quote from Deming. In God we trust, everybody else bring data. An obsession about data. You know, we need to bring data, data, data. And uh, I, I met some German new friends over here, you know, you have this great word, uh, Datensparsamkeit, which is uh, a little bit stating uh, what's new about the new next paradigm, that in people we trust instead, only bring data that you care about for a very good reason. Just because we can look at everything, we don't have to. You know, we don't have to spend all this time looking at the data. We don't always have to have a conversation based around our burn down chart, for example. Let's, let's trust each other instead. Let's not always bring you know, a complex business case before we make a cool decision and so forth. Another great example of this, how many of you have probably listened, if you go to many conferences, to other speeches about this, but read the book Moneyball or watched the movie with, with Brad Pitt? Only two? Three? All right, so I can tell you the story then. Great book, Michael Lewis wrote it. Uh, it's about baseball, and in baseball, how do you build a great team? There was a, there was a team called the Oakland's, Oakland A's, who were the worst. There's a famous quote from Brad Pitt in this movie, like, you know, they, these are the good teams, these are the bad teams, then there's 30 feet of crap, and then there's us. You know, they were horrible as a team. And they had a very complex system of how to look at how to get the right players with scouts and so forth. And what he figured out, or actually was a Harvard graduate figured out for him, uh, together with some, with some people who had been th done a lot of thinking, is that this system of how we define who are a good player, and everybody's doing like this, right, is really wrong. We don't get the right players, and we pay them way too much money. So he found out that we only need to look at on-base percentage. That's the number one thing we need to look at to gain wins. So he had the lowest budget in the whole baseball league, and he won it in Major League uh, Baseball. Pretty amazing story. So, so read the book or watch the movie. So the last example, this is number three then, of what, kind of, what I see as, as differentiating the current paradigm from the next paradigm is that in the current paradigm, performance is reviewed with metrics to a large extent. You know, why, why is your burn-down chart not going down as fast as your burn-down chart? Why are you know, you're not fixing as many bugs as this team is fixing? You know, everything we start to look at very, very quickly became something about performance. 
something that we use to benchmark, something that we use to compare um, with each other. And I can bring up a Deming story again. You know, this is management by results to a large extent. And in the next paradigm, I would, I would like to claim, you know, we need to see the death of reporting at some, some time. You know, just like, well, why, why do you, I usually ask some of our clients, you know, why do you need this? Well, management wants me to show this. Or, you know, we're agile, so we need to have a look at this. We need to, to measure this because we're, we're doing, as they say, in the books and so forth. But instead, I think it's much more about teaching people. Once again, this also relates back to trusting people. Instead of reporting, you teach. So if you're a stakeholder or a manager, etc., it's not someone who is directly involved in what you do on a daily basis. You need to teach that person what is going on. It doesn't really matter how you do that and what, what metric you're using to, to do that with. And uh, I, an example of this I saw uh, just the other day or this week, uh, the company King in Stockholm, making the Candy Crush saga and so forth. You know, how are they so successful? I was looking at their job ads and there are more than 80 data scientists working for them. People whose job it is to figure this thing out and teach everybody else in the company you know, what should we have in a game to make more people addictive to it and so forth. And, and a fairly you know, successful company, maybe you can say what you want about their, their, their ethics and so forth, but it's a data scientists and companies who try to use scientific methods to understand flows are really kind of leading the way in this, this new paradigm. I also wanted to bring up a sort of technological trend on why I see this happening. So this is, you know, I, my own idea, I don't know what to call it, but you know, we have a monetary axis here and we have a time axis here. So you know, we have low cost, high cost, a lot of automatic creation or manual creation and maintenance of, of metrics. You know, how much does it take to, to model our, our metric that we need to make a decision and so forth. And, the tradition is that we come very much from this, you know, data warehousing, traditional reporting solution. You have a specific group within the IT department who is responsible for creating metrics. Um, the first thing I see many agile tools do is throw that out and just go back to whiteboards and stickers and so forth. No waste, you know. We need to have our burn down or we need to measure, look at our flow. Let's just stick to that. Takes as much doesn't cost us as much and still requires a little bit of manual creation and maintenance though. Uh, they are kind of opposite each other, which is also one reason I think why uh, many agile teams are a little bit hesitant to talking about metrics uh, when you first meet them. But we see all this kind of powerful data automation and visualizations tool coming up where you can do all of this really, really, really cool stuff. You just tell the data sources and it's just gonna show up a beautiful graph telling you everything. And I can tell you another story. I met a woman from Walmart. She was delivering a system to two million employees. And she had you know, access to all the beautiful tools she wants and so forth. But she said, you know, my only problem is I can't figure out which single graph that tells me everything. Um, so people are you know, trying to do more than they can probably with, with these tools. And in that case, and I think many others, it's the teams I meet who are successful are moving up to low cost solutions with, you know, it doesn't take much time to get a new idea, a new understanding. We want to analyze our data in this way, we'll just do it. It takes me a few seconds. And that both is due to a lot of improved agile and lean practices, but it's also due to that easier and cheaper technology. You know, you democratize uh, access to metrics. Not only top management is having access to these tools. They're cheap now, so also people on lower levels can, can use them. To give you some concrete examples, you know, what, what, how do I assess where, where someone is on kind of a metric scale and so forth when I'm out meeting people? Uh, the usual suspects is that you have your burndown chart with work remaining in time. And you're looking at you know, how good are we compared to this green line here and next to it you have your number of new bugs. And the whole idea is that you know, we need to balance these two. If we're finishing things too quickly, we're gonna have more bugs. You know, we need to balance this. We need to have a good velocity and we need to commit to enough uh, points and so forth so we can finish it on time and we don't really want to ruin the product because, sure, this is supposed to be working software, but it's not, it's not working all the time, right? 
We all know that. Um, what I see is that people instead start looking at, at things like cumulative flow diagrams and start thinking beyond this are, are getting much, much more information out of their charts that are much more helpful. How many in here are used to using cumulative flow diagrams in your daily work? It's one, two, three. Uh, fairly few. Okay. Uh, I, I love them. You know, really, really great stuff. Not that I want to enforce anyone to use them, but they're great because it gives you an indication of, first of all, you can aggregate and divide these things as you like. So we can have bugs and, and new features and so forth in this where we can see the arrival rate of how much work are we adding. If, for example, when a product owner goes crazy and just add you know, 200 items in there, we can see that. It's very visual for the team. We can also see our departure rate here and the steepness of these curves and, and compare to see what, you know, are we finishing work in the same pace or have, are we having an ever-growing backlog to do with, for example. These things here are typically phases. So here you have things that are not done, things that are in progress, and things that are done. And they have some benefits in terms of that you can do estimations very easily. So when you're adding something here, this is time, you can start looking at the average lead time right now in our entire system, our entire flow. And you can also have a good idea of, of how much work in process you have. A great first step towards looking at something else than just burndowns and number of arriving bugs. There is one big problem with this, and this is that it assumes this kind of flow. It, diffuse, it assumes linearity. They were having, first we have something not done in progress, done. And it might work on a team level, but you know when we're scaling and we're having a lot of things working together, the systems becomes much, much more complex. And very often it turns out when you ask people, how does it you know, actually look like? You know, we have no idea. We thought A related to B, and that was how we reached this desired state over here. Or we read the Lean Startup and we read, well, you know, if we get people visiting our homepage, then we get them to download our product and they're going to buy. And then you start digging into this and you realize there's, there's really much, much more to this. We have no idea how someone is ending up buying our product or how this bug related to something we did always. Because there's just so many people involved everywhere. So how do you understand these these much, much more complex flows and how it actually works. And I think that, you know, companies understand and find a very good method. How do we uncover this and how do we understand them? This is really going to be a competitive advantage. You know, what's, what's the reason why King is, is uh, um, on the stock market and so forth? It probably could have something to do with all the data scientists they're having and how they're working and understanding what is actually going on with every game that they release towards the things that they, that they want to achieve. I like this way of thinking. We have a system. A system has some actors in it, and it has some processes or flows relating to it, and it has some structures. Very, very fluffy, but if we take a concrete example of a small scrum team, we have a couple of stakeholders, customers or investors and so forth. We're having a product, or we might have a team, we have maybe a few other people we have to think about. We have some structures in terms of we have our backlogs, a product backlog, a sprint backlog. We're having sprints, we're having a hierarchy between people, and we're having horrible things such as budgets. And these two things always relate to all these processes we're having. We're having certain ceremonies, we're having an HR and IT and budgeting processes and, and things that we need to, to think about. And if you start to uncover and thinking, okay, so what, how do these relate to each other? How, who is doing what and what is happening when we're affecting something? If an actor here is taking an action, what effect are we expecting that to have? And what decisions do we have to make? And how do we model something to measure around those decisions? And fairly quickly you end up with something um, a little bit more complex and you start to end up changing at every retrospective, what you're looking at, because you realize, oh my god, we can discover so much more. And to give you two examples, the one thing I see is that you take an economic perspective out of things. If we're taking the kind of, you know, what should we actually be doing on the product backlog phase, you 
start to do things like weighted shorted job first and getting a good understanding of how long does it take before we add something until it becomes into prioritized, till we estimate and so forth. You can see all this in cumulative flow diagrams. And a very, very difficult thing to do, but which I, I think is actually working okay, is to use weighted shorted job first. So you estimate something like cost of delay rather than business value and so forth. And you try to do the smallest thing first. For the actual implementation, um, yesterday's weather becoming a more and more popular term that I hear. And yesterday's weather, I think the term uh, relates to that they invested a lot, a lot of money in a very nice satellite to understand what's the weather forecast for tomorrow. I don't know how much money it, it costs, but it turned out we can, we can now tell the weather forecast by 70% certainty. Now, we're going to be right 70% of the time. And it turned out if we just look at yesterday's weather and said it's probably going to be the, the same weather today, we were right about 70% of the time as well. So all that waste, I mean, all that work was completely waste. And this works excellent in many teams. You know, no, we don't do estimations. We just look at, you know, this one took two weeks last time we did. It's probably going to take two weeks this time as well. We don't do any planning poker. So, you know, spend enormous amounts less on planning and so forth. But just looking, what, what was it yesterday? All right, probably the same. And this black box is, of course, a black box because this is where we measure outcome when we're out, you know, the scary market. Uh, taking an economic perspective and measuring actually revenue is um, becoming more and more popular. So you take your revenue and you divide it by your delivered story points, which means if your revenue doesn't go up and you deliver the same pace all the time, it's going to be a flat line. If you're earning less and less and you deliver more and more, it's going to go straight down. And if you're working less and less, but you're earning more and more, it's going to go straight up. So you're connecting your actual outcome rather than errors you're getting back, feedback you're getting back to, to the team's work. As a last example, I also want to say, when you get an advice of some sort, for example, we have a product backlog. Your product backlog should be deep. It should be detailed appropriately. It should be estimated. It should be emergent. It should be prioritized. Then, you know, you can show that. You can measure that. This graph is showing your average size of your backlog items across various priorities. You want to make sure your high priority things are of a certain size and certainly smaller than the things of lower priority. You want to make sure they fit into sprints and so forth. And you want to have a look at that you have as few as possible items that are of no priority. So don't accept advice, measure it instead. So to summarize uh, my presentation, do not stay dogmatic about the metrics you're using. Um, understand your flow. Make truly informed decision making. Don't look at a metric and accept it as a truth. Criticize it very heavily and stop doing boring reporting that you don't see any reason of doing. And then I'm sure you're going to be kings and queens of, of the next paradigm in your organizations. Thank you very much. Here's some inspiration.